The following podcast contains naughty words, grown-up themes, and overall shenanigans. After all, that's what you've tuned in for. Listener discretion is advised. What happens when TV shows, movies, and art fall out of grace with our culture because of themes, characters, and language being deemed as offensive? What makes a film or show controversial, and what enables it to be redeemed? Are there objectively offensive works, or does every piece of art deserve redemption? Can we reconcile the culture of the past and still salvage some of the art and expression of those films and shows? How do we learn from our past without throwing the baby out with the bathwater? How do we avoid becoming the people who ban art? So grab a big old tub of movie butter popcorn or your favorite movie snack and join the panel. I'm your host, Matt, and this is the Going There podcast. And ask me what I am thinking of. I'd rather not fight, but I'll do it all night. Lord, I'd rather be right than in love. Fasten your seatbelts. It might be a bumpy hour, because we're going there. Taboo Topics are back on the table. Film nerds unite film and TV. That's everything we're talking about in this episode. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this thing, let's introduce today's panel. Returning from a recent episode is Ashley Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Keith Phillips. I'm a corporate attorney, and I was told I can say swear words, so I may try to slip one in this time. And you're also a self-admitted nerd. A self-admitted nerd. I'm very proud of it. (laughs) Hi, I'm I'm Robert Banks. I'm the crazy film guy up here in Northeast Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Lived here all my life, and yeah, I make films, and I also like showing films, and I do talk films, even though I'm I'm more of a geek than a nerd, but whatever. See, I knew that- Whatever floats your boat. I knew we were going to have fighting words already. (laughs) Rob, like everyone, for those of you listening who are outside of Northeast Ohio, in the Northeast Ohio film community, Robert Banks is a well-known figure. Real quick, you, in the 90s, uh, had a film, a short film. Oh, yeah. That went... Many short films. That, that some of them that went pretty far that were seen nationally and internationally, oh, yeah. correct? Actually, they all have, yeah. Sundance, um, Rotterdam... Uh, North by North, oh no, South by Southwest. I get them all mixed up. Cleveland International, of course. Yeah, every other major film festival I've been in. I've been well over 200 film festivals in the last 15, 20 years. Film nerds like myself who also make films, it's, I, we're super jealous. But you and I have actually worked on a film together. We just weren't, we just were Which never by each other. Which one was it? Made in Cleveland. Oh, that's right. You directed, I maybe even I, edited I, the I, scene you directed. Book of Love. I did Book of Love. Yeah. I edited Book of Love. You did? And, and that was oh, one I of everyone's know. favorite uh, scene in the whole thing. I didn't know you edited that. Okay, that was me. Uh, no, great job. Man. He just found that out live. <laughs> I just found out. I only saw it one time at this premiere. <laughs> it was, they, they, they gave it to me because they were like, they were very like reassured of my, my editing abilities and they were really excited because they're like, Robert Banks directed this thing. So you and I actually worked on yeah, a project we, we, we together. Did a film together. We that's, just met for the first time 10 minutes ago. Yeah. It's fantastic. No, man, I can't believe that. And that's really, that's cool. That, that rocks. Well, we're, we're excited to have you here. And you also uh, were a, like a special um, guest star at an international uh, film festival in Europe at some point, oh, too, as the, well. The BBC. The BBC British Short Film Festival. Yeah, that was yeah. back in 2001. That yeah. Was, yeah. So even even our friends across the pond know who Robert Banks is. Yeah. So we're we we couldn't be more excited to have you here. So thank you for joining the show with well, us. Thanks today. for having me. This is an honor and a blessing, you know. <laughs> and those of you who may have not seen his gorgeous face yet, but you've heard his voice in season one, our video nerd and film connoisseur, Mr. Michael Madgar. Hello, I'm Michael Madgar, film connoisseur, voice from season one. I. Local musician to Cleveland, playing King Boo, Brudex, and Prize Hog. Here to talk about movies today. Just keep that energy level up, man. That's going great. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start by asking everybody this question. Uh, what was the most recent thing that you can remember re-watching an old film or TV show, especially ones that we thought were like, either nostalgic or benign and going, oh, fuck, 
I forgot that this was in this. That's pretty offensive. Do you guys have any that come to mind right away? So my family watches A Christmas Story every year. It is a family tradition. We've gone to the house here in Cleveland. If you haven't been, you know, it's like a great kind of tour. Yeah, that's a that's a um, big Cleveland staple, especially yes. around Christmas time, because they filmed it here locally, uh, at least most of it. Yeah. Um, so I go there, I watch it every year. But usually before the movie ends, I am the cleaner upper, right? Like I'm like picking up like the Christmas Eve gift boxes. I'm putting away the popcorn kernels. I'm putting all the stuff away. So it's been a few years since I watched the whole thing. And so the final scene when they go to the Chinese food restaurant, and there's like you know this scene there's like the head on the duck and there's you know like they I was like I think that this is an offensive trope and it wasn't until last year when I watched it and I'm prepping to be able to do it again this year that I realized I have to actually talk to my son about it who's 10 years old about how images and film can shape your way that you view people and how that can be like something that you don't want to carry with you for the rest of your life. So that was the most recent one. And you know, you're, you're, if you're like me, you're a white dude in Northeast Ohio, you're watching that. And one of the funniest things is them trying to pronounce fa la 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 la. And they're like, fa ra 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 ra. And so like, that's funny. (laughs) And you do that to Asian people in real life because it's like, well, it's in a movie. It's okay. And then yeah, Rewatching it now because same kind of thing. I hadn't seen it in a few years, and I'm like, oh shit, like, yeah, this is pretty problematic, and it's a fucking Christmas movie. Another Christmas movie, my story is. Was it Holiday? Is it Holiday Inn? Yep, Holiday Inn. There is one of the most shocking blackface scenes that goes on for a long time, and there's a gag in it that's supposed to be funny. The payoff is the actress comes out, this white lady comes out, and they don't want her to be recognizable because Bing Crosby doesn't want her to be seen or noticed by somebody who he's like kind of like in, in conflict with. And so she comes out in blackface, and it's supposed to be for a gag. And I remember my wife and I looked at each other, and, and I was just so happy that it was just the two of us watching it. Because if anybody else had been there, I would have just been so embarrassed and we kept watching it, but there was no way to reconcile that scene. The rest of the film, I'm like, I don't care what happens to these people. I hope they blow this whole fucking stadium up. Like it's so bizarre. Even in context, that scene, I don't know how it could have even been perceived as humorous or even really particularly entertaining because it, it doesn't really hit on any level, like even for the time. And I'm sure it was more lowbrow when it came to that stuff then because it was just part of the norm. Like but Al Jolson like, like made a whole career of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But he was good at it though. Right. He was really good at it. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, it was just, it was, I, I'll just say like, it was jarring. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I showed Mike that clip the other day and he was, I think Sur- even even yeah. before, even after I had explained it to you, you're like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Because it is, it's not even like, it's so overt. It's so over the top. It's out of left field too. I feel like <laughs> as well. I don't. I don't. I just. I didn't get it. I don't. I don't know what point was being made other than this covert mission that you were kind of explaining. I had never seen that movie. Oh. Like, oh, you guys are on the subject of like offensiveness to like Asians in films. Like, I feel like John Hughes did dirty by them the entirety of his career. Like, yeah. you look at a character like Long, Long Duck Dong and Sixteen yeah. Candles. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's a cartoon character at that point, and, and like he's not he's even a, a walking, well-written one. He's a walking punchline. Yeah, uh, and the whole joke is he's Asian. Like yeah. that's the joke. That's, that's it. the entirety of the joke. Like, yeah. Do you have Do you have another film that recently you watched that had the or TV show that you had this reaction to? So I mean, I guess just to not keep it going to comedy and stuff like that, like or Christmas, yeah. or Christmas. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> the Alejandra Aja movie High Tension is a film that gets a little too excited by its violence. Like it's a film that sort of gets off on this gratuitousness of this like torturous violence that's happening to like families and children and stuff like that. And they just, they kind of go far with it in a way that I feel like is unsatisfying to probably the people that participated in it, probably to the viewer with enough, like, cause you can do that and it can still be entertaining, but this was clearly someone that was just too entertained by it. So it's off putting, like it's too realistic and they're too excited about it. Like, that offers no value. You mean him? Well, do you think him as a director or in terms of what he was giving the, the audience? That film, yeah, in terms of what he's giving the audience. Because I've seen restraint from him well, with we, other films. Yeah. But that's one that I feel like he was really kind of left to his own ambitions. And well, you think that's a European thing or is that like, I don't know. Well, I mean, you could look at the entirety of like yeah. Gaspar Nowy's like career and see movies like Irreversible where yeah, they give you yeah. a 10-minute unsimulated rape scene in a tunnel. Like... Yeah, that he didn't even film. He filmed that like two, three times. Yeah, like why you have to film that at all? Like, what are you trying to tell somebody with that? What are you trying to show them? Like, 
was the point of a scene like that in the grand scheme of things? Like, because he wanted to see it or because he wanted to show people that? Or I think it was more or less about the nature of how we perceive that. I think a lot of filmmakers, when they do rape scenes, they try to make it somewhat semi-sensational, but they still want to show that, oh, it's not a good thing, but... You know, look at this finesse that goes in how, and she likes, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, you can yeah. say that about straw dogs or whatever. Sure, I mean, but I feel like with straw dogs, it's like that's the final straw that like broke the camel's back. Like in that movie, like they're pushing Dustin Hoffman, pushing Dustin Hoffman, pushing Dustin Hoffman. And it takes for literally an entire village of people to rape his wife for him to finally be like, you know what? I've had enough of this. But he doesn't like, know that. He never knows that he, they raped his wife. That's right. What, that's what makes it so interesting. Right, yeah. right. I that mean, was Peck never and Pot, yeah. like in general, is like a master of like manipulating the viewer in that way. Yes. But that movie, like, um, bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia, yeah, like a, yeah. especially like yes. you, you're fooled as the viewer that entire film. But yeah. like it's yeah, that's a film. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're gonna off subject, I guess. I don't know. No, <laughs> that, you're, you guys are you guys are right on subject, and I you know we'll we'll get into kind of the nuance of it uh, here in a little bit. But there is certainly, in my opinion, a, a, a difference between. Uh, making something that you know is edgy or that you know is going to offend people and making something that you're doing it going, this isn't offensive. And, you know, why are people so offended by it? And we'll, sure. we'll, we'll get into that a little sure. bit. Yeah. Um, Robert, do you have one that comes to mind? I'm still trying to think about it. <laughs> I've had some, but um, no one's ever asked me that question in a while. So I have, I'm trying to think back. It's like, hmm. So I remember many cartoons that did the whole blackface thing, but when you're a kid looking at that, you don't think about it as that. Sure. Because a lot of those cartoons back then were censored when they were re-released. These were like the old Warner Brothers and whatnot. Yeah. And I remember seeing, okay, a good example. This is the only one that pops in my head. Um, it was that one Porky Pig cartoon where he's the cop and he goes to the haunted house and the ghost is there singing Jeepers Creepers. From the... I know what you're talking I, I about. Yeah. Which one you're See, talking about. Okay, yeah. yeah. Now, they used to show that all the time on TV, but I remember the ending was always abrupt. And I kept thinking they cut the ending. And my buddy, Ted Schroeder, had a 16 print of that. And he ran it at a film night years ago. And it was uncensored. And it showed what happened. Somehow, um, something explodes in the ghost's face because Porky Pig's trying to get out of the house. And he tricks the ghost and it blows up. And all of a sudden, the ghost is all in blackface. Next, you know, he goes to the camera and says, Gee, oh, daddy, blah, 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 doing a whole, you know. Oh. And I was like, oh, that's what they cut out of there. And I, and I thought, okay, that was kind of stupid. But I don't think that was worth censoring. Right. But he was doing the whole Rochester pseudo, you know, type thing. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I just, I don't know. When you're a kid, just like, okay, well, big deal. Because me had many characters perceived as that. But I don't think they were trying to say, yeah, he's being, you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, the whole thing behind the blackface thing, I can understand in certain aspects. Yeah, it's crossing the line. And in certain cases, for kids' films, or when I, I take the back, not kids' films, because a lot of these cartoons were more adult-oriented, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People would watch yeah. these. Adults would go to yeah. the theater and I mean, watch so seeing that, you know, played in Saturday afternoons or, you know, the, the Bugs Bunny show, whatever, I don't know, I just, it, I don't know. It's just one of those things that I don't know how to take that, especially as a person of color. I mean, it's just certain things I don't, you know, I mean, you're talking to a guy who watched all the little rascals and I remember right. seeing the, you know, the, what's it, the kid from Borneo? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I know <laughs> nowadays, you know, they, they go out of the way to make sure nobody's, you ever see that? Oh yeah, that's you know yum yum eat them up you know yum yum eat them up yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they're shooting them with the yeah. with the bottle rocket yeah, in the exactly. ass and yeah stuff. it's like you know I just I never really realized okay this is this is offensive I guess but and we, as a kid I mean as a kid <laughs> yeah. you don't think in those terms I, I think I mostly mean, yeah. but it, but it's crazy that a lot of the kids content was the stuff that had especially when we're talking about like sexism racism homophobia yeah. the kids stuff was littered with that I I well no exactly I yes. went out of my way to find Song of the South. Yeah. Because they stopped making it. They stopped producing it. You can't find it anywhere. Because I'm like, I really want to try to have a handle on why this is offensive. Um, because I couldn't even remember it. And, and I read about it, but I wanted to watch it. And, you know, the reason it's... <laughs> Song of the South, you could do an entire thesis on this because... I know people that have, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, we should have had them on shit. <laughs> so he here's, here's why I think it's an interesting thing. Because it made me somewhat change my, not my point of view, but my, the way I wanted to handle this conversation. Because in doing my own research on it, I started to realize these problems were known at the time. Like, there's part of me that thinks, well, culturally, we just didn't know any better. 
But almost in every single case, culturally, we did know better. When Song of the South came out, the NAACP was boycotting it because what it did was it tried to gloss over the restoration period in America post-Civil War yeah. where it was like, oh, you know, he's a happy guy and he's singing about the good old days when he was a slave yeah. and, and it's problematic. And he, uh, the guy who plays Uncle Remus was given an honorary Academy Award but he and the rest of the black cast could not even go to the film's premiere in Atlanta because of segregation. Right. And so a lot of the conversations that culturally and, and as a society we've been seeing about films like that are, we just didn't know any better. No, we fucking knew nobody was actually listening. And I'm not, and, and so I think the big question that comes from all of this is what do we do with that information? Like you're watching Little Rascals. What do we do? How do we come to terms with it? Do we learn with it? Do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Do we burn it all to the ground and start over? What do we do with these films and shows that have this stuff that is no longer considered socially acceptable? And probably most of it wasn't considered acceptable even when it was made. Context, I would say like viewer beware, like we have information at our tools that is very valuable that can tell you what the contents of what you're about to watch are. I think that people have a certain responsibility to the art that they consume and share with others, like what it is and what they're trying to get out of it. Because I feel like some of those movies may have the wrong points, but for historical reasons, they are valuable to like film and history and like general. Yeah, the thematically and technically as well as because the objective back then was strictly for entertainment. Right. But in many ways, they crossed the line of exploitation yeah. and all that. So, I mean, there's been loads of films from back then that definitely are questionable, but yet they're still entertaining. But then again, as a person of color, is it okay to laugh with the audience or should you feel upset about it? You know, I mean, should you get a weird vibe. I mean, when I ran Birth of a Nation for my students, I mean, technically, the film is still brilliant. That film blows me away. Right. But it, at the same time, I'm so pissed about the message because D.W. Griffith had so many means to address this, but instead he had to promote the fact that this is a mythical, epic story that he had to be told this way. But I'm just thinking, yeah, but at the expense of... You know, the, the uh, four, the, you know, think about it. That film wasn't that entire race of people. Yeah, exactly. At the time where that was the last thing that they needed to be painted as, and have and, and having white actors in blackface. Yeah, playing. playing I mean, <laughs> so for those of you, you know, watching or listening, if you haven't seen Birth of a Nation or heard about it, look it up. Um, Embrace yourself. It is considered like one <laughs> of the first cinematic epics yeah. ever created, and. As Robert's saying, as a black man sitting here saying, technically, it, it's so. Like, yeah, I don't think. You know, basically, black men are evil, and they're going to come in and rape your wives and attack your children. That's that's essentially the core theme of the film, right? Yeah, right. yeah. And it's horrible, and it and it's known that it's horrible, but it was also a big megaphone for the KKK, and I yeah. mean, they're the heroes of the film, essentially. Yeah, they were the Lone Rangers. They're the Robin Hoods, and it just, you know. It's super it's cringe fucked up. It's cringeworthy. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it's important that it exists and that you can show it. I, I guess the question is, do we, do we then see it as a historical archive, or do we see it as entertainment? Because I don't well, think it's entertainment. <laughs> it's hard to be entertained by that, but it's really hard to not admire it. It's like, wow, it's like, you know, look at the scope and look at the battle scenes alone were phenomenal and no one had ever done, done that before. So right. D.W. Griffith, he just, he broke barriers, I mean, not broke barriers, but he broke ground in terms of showing cinema as being this new medium that's gonna become this phenomenal thing that's gonna empower every aspect of the audience being taken to, to a whole nother experience. This was one of the, the sad thing is this is one of the first films to do it. But, but I, I think as <laughs> Americans, honestly, I think, Socially, one of our biggest mistakes is never acknowledging and learning from the history that we have. Thank you. We are too embarrassed to say, this is what happened, this is who we are, and we will learn from it and we will grow from it. Instead, it's a, okay, that was back then, let's ignore it, let's clean it up, let's start fresh, and we'll start anew. It never works. Because every single person who was there for the precursor passes that knowledge down to the next generation. Whether you put it in a movie, whether you write it in a book, right. whether or not you discuss it openly, that information gets passed down 
anyway. And I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that we have this desire to delete it all start afresh and say, let's figure out how we can do this. And you've got grandpa in the back room who's like, well, back in my day, it was never offensive to do this. I don't see what the big deal is. You watch Birth of a Nation and then you watch Bamboozled, which is another movie that's made entirely in blackface. And it is black actors going through experience of realizing you can get rich, you can entertain an audience, you can go through blackface and it takes an emotional toll on you. At the end of the day, you are worse off than you were had you been poor, unknown and never gone through the experience. If you watch those two films together, you come out of it with a different experience about what you think blackface is than if you watch Birth of a Nation or if you hear your grandpa talking about what it was like and nobody used to be offended. We can't ignore it. Yeah. We can't erase it. We can't delete it. So we may as well confront it. That's a great movie to tie that into, by the way. Like, yes. That's a really good point. That is also what I was going to say, too, if you want to look at it from a historical perspective of how history has been the liberties that Hollywood's taken with. You can compare Birth of a Nation to The Woman King. I mean, oh, yeah, that's a I good mean, one. Because I've been getting nothing but, but people emailing me saying, did you see Woman King yet? And it's like, don't go see it. Don't get a boycott. I was like, well. I saw it twice. Oh, you saw it twice. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, it's like, okay. And the Wait, thing, I do have to ask, why were they going to boycott yeah. Woman King? Oh, do you know? Oh, you, you know I didn't the, know the controversy about it. About it. Yeah. You want to tell them? So there's like the the the, the, the homie tribe. The homie I'm, tribe. I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. Oh, oh that's right. Well, so the, <laughs> well, the, the homie tribe is like, it's based in Africa and they are involved in some way um, in the slave trade in Africa and they are in dealings with Europeans. Right. And so the movie is based off of like how they go through this and some people are saying it's not enough explicit enough about their involvement and their culpability in it. There are other people who are saying that they didn't go into enough detail about how like detrimental the slave trade was to that, you know, like tribe into Africa as a whole. There are other people who are saying who are glorifying it and, you know, they don't discuss enough about the differences in, you know, like social classes. But the main thing though was, you know how in Birth of a Nation, the KKK were the good guys? Yeah. Well, the Dahomeys apparently were like the KKK over there because they were involved in the slave trade and they were enslaving other tribes, and not just enslaving them, but literally slaughtering them. There was mass genocide, and this tribe was one of the key tribes that were just going out and just, you know. And then on top of that, they wanted to maintain the slave trade. They wanted to continue it. But and so it's like a refilming, yeah, yeah like a reframing. Yes. They depict them as being the good guys, and we're right. going to fight the French, and we're not going to... And, then, you know, so a lot of people, especially a lot of historians, are really... Right. angry about yeah. that and they're saying they're taking something historical and they're flipping it upside down and it's all sensationalism once again just go online you read about it. there's like a ton of youtube videos about it yeah I'm, I'm usually up to date on on stuff like that yeah. like i'm i'm a it's, i'm a big know. nerd when it comes to research and why people actually, don't like movies really, yeah. i think it's worth watching yeah. it honest. looks really good and i was i was happy to see because they were showing you know because so often, especially in American film, American cinema, like everything historically that we do is uh, almost all about the male dominated patriarchal, um, yeah. you know, historical uh, atrocities and all these things. But, you know, we, we tend to lose sight oftentimes that in history, there have been lots of female led, uh, you know, matriarchies, yeah. essentially. And that's what that looked like is you had a bunch of badass women, but not fictional Wak when Wakandans, you know, like you actually had this like real group of people and it was trying to dress them up as the good guy, but it sounds like maybe they weren't the well, good guys. It's like, I don't disagree with the, you know, the people who want to boycott it. My question is how many people in America generally have heard of the Dahomey tribe prior to this movie being made. Exactly. And, that and was, if that, oh, and that sparks that. you yeah. and that to was... research, to look into, to read more about it, that is the point of entertainment and art to get you to question things that you've been presented with to get you to ask additional information and I am happy that the public discourse is not a single voice from the producer's office telling you this film is the most monumental and life-changing thing and it's the only voice that you'll ever hear right? right like you go like I I can talk to anybody I'm like oh my gosh the color purple is like a pivotal film it shaped my life you know blah blah, blah. I get you know like becoming adult I'm like what do you mean shut out of the Oscars <laughs> What the heck is like back to Africa? I've never even heard of this movie. You know what I mean? I've like, watched Color Purple 150 times. And it's one of those things that once you get the opportunity for other people to tell you, this is great. This is worth looking into. This is worth evaluating. This is worth, you know, learning something about. I think that that's the value of the art that it creates. Even if it's not historically accurate all the time, or it's not 100% an evaluation of the value in the society at the time that it occurred, having those questions, I think, presents value. Yeah, it's just people have to go out of the way to want to 
discuss this and ask or whatever, because I encourage my students constantly, if you see a film you like, or you have a question about the narrative or whatnot, do the research. Go, there's no excuse. Go online and just do the research. Yeah. You know, oh, I don't mean, do TikTok. I'm sorry, guys. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, find yeah. somebody do who read like a book. Research. Yeah. Yeah. If you <laughs> can't even book. even get a book or something, I I'll mean, tell you but, what, you know, though. You yeah, want to I mean, you want to piss off a bunch of people. Make any kind of historical epic because you have to take so much creative license with it. And there's nothing that pisses me off more than when somebody does something historical and. And tries to dress it up as fact, and they change so many elements of it. What do you think about the film Pearl Harbor? Well, I was going to say that that's an <laughs> oh. example. That's yeah, that's a good example. I, I wouldn't call it film. <laughs> <laughs> the documentary they made that to go along with it was fantastic. Sure. <laughs> what like okay, Braveheart. Everyone loves Braveheart. There's yeah, so many historical atrocities. Yeah, yeah. Like as far as the storytelling that they took so much license with that is complete bullshit. Yeah. And when they over glorify or try to make a protagonist more likable. It's like, you know, like uh, simultaneous films that came out were Tombstone and Wyatt Earp. The Wyatt Earp one was terrible. Kevin Costner, <laughs> Wyatt Earp was terrible, but it actually painted him more accurately where he was cheating on his wife. He yeah. was kind of a drunk. He was yeah. kind of an asshole. Tombstone, which is an amazing film, totally made him this like really good boy scout who just wanted to do good. Good old Kurt Russell's <laughs> back, you know. Somebody who probably was in blackface in an old Disney movie. What's, what's wrong with like documentaries though? Like I think that Thank people you. put too much emphasis on the entertainment industry, right? Like the industry is set up for the purposes of giving you a story that will resonate with the audience. And so if you say to yourself like, oh my gosh, you know, like this woman would have never worn a front lace corset in this century and I can't believe the costume watch a documentary, yeah. you know, like read, you know, like a, a, a book about, you know, the history of like undergarments of women in you know, colonial America or whatever the case may be. Like sometimes it's just sexy to unlace in the front, right? Like sometimes yeah. that's the reason that they choose it. And it has nothing to do with the historical accuracy of it. And I don't think that we should hold filmmakers to the same standard that we would do an academic journal or a documentary film that says it's de depicting the events actually as they occurred. I think that that's a disservice to the industry. Not everybody's going to have like the intelligence or the budget to be Stanley Kubrick. Like there's going to be people out there that have to make those kind of movies on a budget. And like, I, I agree with what you're saying. I wish they would just documentary style that stuff rather than well, on top of that to be a cheap movie. You want to make it entertaining and people don't want to be educated. They don't go to the movies to see everything force fed to them in a very formal way, even though you know, we want to see things more accurate, but at the but same time... But isn't there a way to when, do when, it where you're not force-feeding it and still... Like, like for example, when they uh, Steven Spielberg created Lincoln, they actually recorded, yeah. like, the church bell that was actually there at the time and the creaking floor. No one's going to know that yeah. unless you go out of your way to figure it out, but it's like, I have an appreciation for that shit. So, yeah, like, so, so what I, end, yeah. Like, yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis, like, built his own house to live at on set. <laughs> like, who's telling I'm him to do that? I'm not saying you need to go to, like, <laughs> Day-Lewis kind of shit. <laughs> Like, not those kind of okay. extremes. But I do appreciate when they do, like, Valkyrie. Um, Valkyrie was, he did, they did so, and not that Brian Singer is by any means, like, an amazing the filmmaker. Tom Cruise. like the Tom Cruise, yeah. uh, all, all the assassination plots that were going on against Hitler by his own people, because it was good to see, oh, yeah, there were a lot of Germans and stuff who wanted this fucker gone, too. Yeah. Um, but like, there's a lot of historical accuracy to it. And, and watching it, you don't need to know that. You can just enjoy it. But then watching like the making of, I really appreciate that they go out of their way to be like, they'd be wearing this kind of thing and his watch would be like this. And I, I think as adults, we kind of have a responsibility to say to younger people, oh, this film is great. And it's like a really great historical depiction, right? Like, I think that we have lost intellectual integrity as an adult population. Yeah. Well, and we yeah, need yeah. to <laughs> reclaim that, right? Like, there's no reason that my 10-year-old son should come to me and say to me, like, Mom, is this how it was? And I say, who knows? Good luck for the rest of your life. Like, if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer to it. I should look it up and circle back to you later. And I think that that's part of the missing component. We put so much pressure and emphasis on an entertainment industry that it is designed to be a moneymaker. Yeah, it's, and we have yeah. abs like uh, totally like shifted the responsibility for parents, for community, for teachers, for leaders, for guidance onto this industry that is designed for the purpose of being profitable. Right, that's the nature of the beast though, yeah. I mean, you, what was it, Harlem Nights? You ever see that? Oh, favorite. 
Give me some. No, no I hate oh. that film. <laughs> I'm an, I don't swear. I'm going to swear. That film is bullshit. I hate it's, that movie. It's not a historical And the thing film, is, my it's family, so my, I that, love that he my, hates my it. parents <laughs> were from that. Like, I no. have older parents. That was their lifestyle. My dad, my mom. And it's like when I watched that film, we were all watching it together. And they were up there like, you see how he's trying to be? I was just thinking, okay, why do y'all think this is cool? This is crap, man. It's like. Um, why are we seeing ourselves? I mean, everybody swore. I mean, I know everybody's swearing here. Jasmine's but guy's every, got like the little gun in her pillow. Uh, De, I, he De seeing, Reese seeing De is in the, Reese in, like the, that. in the alleyway you, getting into a fight I'm, with Eddie Murphy. And like, then on top of that, Red Fox wasn't even funny in this. He, I didn't like his character. I didn't like anybody in this. Uh, and I was thinking. How many Eddie, heart Eddie attacks Murphy, did he Eddie, have in it? <laughs> Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor together. I thought, oh, this is going to be a masterpiece. No, that film was garbage. Oh. I think I'm the only black man on the planet that hates that film. Like, <laughs> like critically... It's not like mainstream people. It's not one of those like everyone. It's a cult everyone's, classic. It's though. a cult for all the classic. Wrong reasons, but Same that's like just, like yeah. coming come to America, for example. Well, no, no, but that's a better movie. One of the movies that people <laughs> like take huge issue with, yeah. and I understand yeah. why. Yeah. But I will watch it anytime that it comes on. And but it's at the least same that was entertaining. Harlem. That was pleasantly entertaining. Harlem Nights just got old. Her name after. was Sunshine, and she was a prostitute no. because. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like I said, I'm a minority here when it comes to that. So, uh, yeah. Guys, watch but that's just nice yeah. But no, a lot of people like that film. You know, I just but um. It's so funny. Well, no, like I said, it's cool. I think Blazing Saddles, <laughs> Blazing Saddles is a way better film though, and it was funny, and that film holds up. Harlem Nights to me doesn't even hold up now. <sighs> but like I said, yeah, I don't know, like I said, I'm a minority there. I mean, All right, I just, I'm sorry that no, I'm no, no, it's cool. Like I said, it's it. just no, I'm, I'm I'm the only person that hates that movie. I hate what, that what, movie. What are your uh, feelings on? I'm gonna get you, sucker. Uh, okay. Now, see, that's is, a movie I, but, that I hate. <laughs> see, and I grew up on those black boy teacher films. And that, he nailed it in that. But the Wayans, are, the Wayans brothers are funny, though. Those guys were funny. Yeah, well, the whole thing about her movie. having and like, and demon killer cramps. <laughs> hey, that, you can't tell me that that one wasn't like a low blow for like the women that were watching the movie. But you have to know what they were, they were referencing. They were referencing Abby, the movie Abby. That was like a film buff movie. Uh-huh. Every movie they were ref- referring to, I'm thinking, oh yeah, that was from that and that was that. But it was it was like inside jokes. The movies but unhinged. I think that's why that film only has a limited um, viewership because yeah you have to know that genre like everybody talks about black dynamite and i say no the, yeah. I, i'm gonna get you sucker did it first and better mm-hmm. but black dynamite's good too but okay. but you he, know like king and ivory ivory wayans was the like the og of like turning it on its head yeah. and doing the the parody black exploitation yeah. from a black uh, yeah. storyteller yes. point yeah. of view. I wish he would have done like Coming to America too. I'm yeah. very disappointed. Anybody, no, 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 I, agree. I, agree. I, yeah. I think he, yeah. he was the right choice. Did for they that. give it yeah. back to John Landis? Is that who like? Um, no, he did the, the blackish guy. Uh, uh, Barris. Uh, yeah. Kenny Barris? Is that his, Kenneth? I can't think of his name, I but can't. I know who you're talking about. All right, about. Yeah. now everybody's going to come on like, that's not that guy's name. This lady doesn't We're know what you're talking about. this shit out. <laughs> I can't so, remember. But, so, yeah. you know, and... and it's great because this is why we have this panels. We're we're getting deep into some of the things that you know Robert's offended as a creator, not as a black man, and and that's that's fantastic. Take that for what it's worth. I mean, but a lot of a lot of the conversation is dominated by things that are deemed culturally inappropriate now, like the Christmas films we were talking about and things like that. So I guess the big question is like culturally, are we allowed to evolve? You know, if we look back at our own past, I mean, you look back at old photos, you're like, oh, my God, look at my hair, look at my clothes. Like, you know, we're not just going to throw away the pictures of us with mullets. You know, we have to come to terms with it. How do we how do we reconcile and find redeemable value in some of the shows and films that have offensive material within them? Is there a line? Is there a if you go past this line, there is no redeemable value of it? case by case context like i feel like a lot of it like say you look at you know roman polanski's movies like or how something do you like watch that. a roman polanski film and separate the artist from the art kevin spacey was separated from being in like the movie the like what uh the one that he was replaced with christopher Plummer, the yeah. ridley scott movie yeah. that yeah. came out like yeah. they, they they took him out of the movie and reshot it because they're like we don't want anything to do with this right yeah. like so, what is that? So like that's unprecedented. Like how do you how do you guys feel about that? Like can you separate? Can you watch a Bill Cosby? I cannot movie and see it's weird. I can even though you know you have to. Here's the thing. It's okay. You I found something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and this since we're talking about Bill Cosby, we're getting off subject, but I'm gonna tie into that. 
Ghost Dad. Because I grew up. You, <laughs> Leonard you're, 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 close. you're close. You're close. You're oh, close. No. Is it the one where he's the spy? No, it's uh, an ostrich. It's the devil and um. You know which one the, I'm the talking about? The devil and uh, Max Devlin. Oh wow. yes, 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 okay. yes. Okay, now here's what it is, and this is kind of an odd thing. So this is me being the geek, like I said. <laughs> um, a favorite act, character actor of mine is Reggie Nalder. You know who he is. What what else is he in? If Mike doesn't know yeah, him, I'm, no, I'm surprised no. you should Mike know. can you name should know. Okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna tell you who he is. The guy who played a janitor in one scene in some obscure film from 30 years ago. When I tell you who it is, you're gonna see why. making a big deal about this. Now, Reggie Nalder is one of my favorite character actors, and you'll find out also why. Um, but apparently him and Bill Cosby was in, they were in, they, they were in the TV series I Spy together back okay, in the 60s. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess they got along fine and everything, but they also worked on The Devil and Max Devlin. And um, apparently in an interview before he passed away, Reginald Alder, they asked him about what was it like working with Bill Cosby? Because in the film, Reginald Alder plays Satan in that film. Right. And he said, Bill Cosby sadly was a rude, despicable pig. He was just condescending and just arrogant and just wouldn't give me, he didn't show me any respect or anything. I mean, he was just, and I was just thinking, huh. And I, I remember reading that interview years, years ago and I was like, wow. But I heard rumors about him being that way. I didn't think much about it, but I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of sad to hear. And then of course, all this other stuff that happened years later, yeah. I'm just thinking, okay, well, maybe it sounds like he wasn't, but despite all that, I still love the old stuff that he did. I mean, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids and all that. Um, all Friends Ashore, you ever see that? That was that was a TV movie he did. That was really it wasn't even a comedy. It was a drama. It was really good. And of course, you know, Uptown Saturday Night. All that, you know. But I'm just thinking, man, it's like even the Cosby Show. It's like, yeah, it's hard to watch that now. But when I heard that talk from um, Reggie Nalder, it just made you wonder. It was like, what was going through Bill Cosby's head? It's like, did his ego get big, or do you feel that he was? And he, he what, yeah. what the hell, man? It's just you know, and, and drugging it's, women. I don't know. It's just <laughs> and it's tough too because it. <laughs> He basically, it was a monster hiding behind that really colorful sweater. So you watch it and you're like, you're watching it and you're like, okay, maybe I can separate myself. But I also understand when people can't because they're like, this is why people weren't on to him. Because he played, uh, have you guys seen, we need to talk about Bill Cosby? The, do I, the documentary. Yeah. I heard about it. Didn't see it. But I heard about it. I didn't yeah. watch it all the way through. I have a, a tough time consuming that kind of content. Gotcha. I thought it was really well done. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought he did a phenomenal job with the storytelling. But basically, like, because this guy was such a family man, uh, like, people just weren't on to him. And he put on such a good public persona that when people did say bad things about him, you're like, they're just trying to take him down. I think well, that there's sir. a certain amount of there, – there are layers – to where you can draw your lines. Sure. I think that people underestimate the amount of knowledge that women have about sexual assault. Well, whether it is personal, whether mm -hmm. it relates to you as a friend, whether it is a phone call that you've received in the middle of the night that sounds suspicious and you ask them about it the next day and they don't want to talk about it. There's a lot of information that we carry with us throughout our lives that make entertainers like that impossible to ignore and say to myself, that's something I can get over on behalf of myself and every other woman I know who has ever been, put me in a position of trust to be able to say, I can overlook that. I have a different lens from anybody else on the panel because of that. Yeah. So I can look at certain content that has offensive content and I can say, you know what, actually when I look at this, when I discuss it this way, I can have an analytical whatever. I have an emotional attachment to the subject matter that is a result of my gender. And I think that people have the right to say, I can't consume this content because it is racist, sure. because it is offensive, because it is sexist, because it is brutal. And my personal experience tells me no amount of information that you give me is going to make it worth consuming. And I think part of what we have to do is say, you are right for yourself mm -hmm. and it's okay, but I also have the right to choose for me. If you tell me I wanna watch this movie and I say, oh, I'm not gonna watch it with you, those two things should be okay to say out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think that unless we have we're talking about that. Harlem Nights. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, and, and sort of back up what, what you're saying, um, at the same time, it's kind of awkward because what you were asking about, can you separate that from that? Every other person that I grew up watching in terms of their films, actors, directors, you read all the stuff about their laundry or their dirty laundry, or whatever, yeah. and it's like, oh, and now it's like, can I look at Boris Karloff the same way? Right. Can I look at Charlie Chaplin the same way? Can I look at Harold Lloyd the same way? Can I, you know, and it's just a huge list of people, directors, writers that did some messed up stuff. I mean, there's very few people like, who who have really come out clean. Yeah. You yeah. know, we're, I mean, all, we're all holding hope for Tom Hanks, you know? Like, oh, God bless him. And his freaking weird son, yeah. right? Like, what's going Sons. on with that? 
His sons are all. What's wrong with Colin Hanks? <laughs> what are, it's the Chet. It's the Chet. That's the problem. Chet, yeah, Colin the, Hanks is the is the Jim Belushi of the Hanks family. It's like we had so much hope for you, kid. You just didn't do it. Wow. <laughs> all right. I feel no, bad I, for the guy. So, yeah, it, it's it's interesting because I don't think there is an absolute answer to any of it. I mean, I don't think there should be. But I do think culturally we do have to, one, discuss it, and two, figure out what makes sense. Like I said, a lot of these things that get all of the conversation and all of the, the, the airtime are usually the ones that are like Song of the South. It's like, let's, let's really hone in on that. Let's really talk about this. Um, but I, I do think that we do need to decide as a, as a society to some extent what is still culturally acceptable as entertainment because – so so a, a good example I was thinking about the other day is there are people who could make an argument to some of these things we've discussed and say this perpetuates racism or sexism or bigotry or like glossing over, you know, like you love Kubrick and I understand most filmmakers do yeah. fucking a clockwork orange. I'm sorry. It glorifies rape. Um, and, it glorifies and deviancy, deviancy, which is and, like, but that's the, the like the whole concept but of the everyone, film. Is everyone like, glorifies those characters, sure. and they want to dress up as them and act like them. And you know, that doesn't mean that they're going to go out raping people. Yeah. No, like, no, no, no. But and I'm not making the argument that it perpetuates those things. I'm saying people have made and can make those arguments about all kinds of different films and TV shows. But at the same time, I think it's also about a lens, right? Some people could watch All in the Family and say. Archie Bunker perpetuates bigotry and racism and all these things when the average person, I think, watches it and goes, he's the punchline. Like, yeah, his exactly. ignorance yeah. is we're, the punchline. We're laughing at him. We're laughing yeah. at him. I yeah. think that we can't assume that everyone is intelligent. I'm sorry, no, but not. I don't no, think right. that we can yeah. make that assumption. So I think that if you are a studio who's going to do, you know, like a, a TV stream versus, you know, like whatever, you should record or like have a statement at the forefront like this you know, is disturbing. I like, for example, the Bill of Cosby. Of course, thing. the lawyer wants to no, put the disclaimer no, the, at the, the front for, of it. For the, for the Bill Cosby thing. The following I, episode I is going to be punchable. <laughs> I've inadvertently <laughs> watched and consumed content that in, like it contains very graphic sexual assault scenes without any kind of forewarning. I watched the the series Rome. It shows up out of nowhere. I watched this movie. I'm sorry, another spoiler alert. There's a new movie that's released like on streaming service called The Girl Who Had It All or The Girl Who Has Everything, something along that. Out of nowhere, a very graphic scene that comes about. There are all these movies that happen and I have no idea that that is what I am sitting down for. I have no so, idea that that's what I'm walking so, into. So I think it's okay to say this has violence, this has nudity, this has this. One, one thing is... Um, Disney Plus is one of the many streams that's like, okay, we're going to start putting these. Here's what they wrote. This program includes negative depictions and or mistreatment of people of, or cultures. They're, these stereotypes were wrong then and are wrong now. Rather than remove this content, we want to acknowledge its harmful impact, learn from it, and spark conversation to create a more inclusive future together. The issue I have with that, well, first of all, Mark Twain said, censorship is telling a man he can't have steak just because a baby can't chew it. The problem I have with putting that disclaimer is they tell you how to feel about yeah. it. They aren't just telling you there's mistreatment of people. And I get what you're saying because we are a very stupid society. But we're not going to get any smarter by spoon feeding people how to feel and telling them what but to think. But you're looking at it from an adult perspective, right? So if I'm eight years old yes. and my mom says like, oh, turn on something on the TV while I cook dinner. Yeah. I go into the Disney Plus app, which is kid friendly. I select something and there's this message that comes up front. I say as an eight year old, like, mom, what does this mean? I then can say either I'm going to explain it to you or this is content that you shouldn't consume. Mm -hmm. I think we should not assume that the average person who's getting this message is adult, mature, fully developed frontal cortex, able to make these decisions and determinations on our own. Disney Plus is a phenomenal place to put that kind of warning because of the audience that it targets. You want 15 year old boys to get this message before they watch it so they don't go out and say, you know what? I think that guy was actually the hero. No, he wasn't the hero. And you found that out before you started watching but, the movie. Okay, so, I, so <laughs> I'm a 10-year-old I'm a kid. I read that message. I don't understand what the hell it said. It's not the message that... I, I guess it's more for the parents 
to maybe have that conversation with the child, which about is what I'm talking about it's, about it's the responsibility. It is responsibility to like yes. not have to get in trouble with parents and still make money off yeah. of stuff that they know is which offensive. Is their, which is their model. Mm -hmm. They are a corporation that is designed to please their shareholders. Mm -hmm. I hold Disney shares, so I don't have anything against them. You know, <laughs> I'm one of those people. But I am the also following mom, film shows right? us when like, we were super racist and owned slaves ourselves. Exactly, and I like. And I, Walt Disney was trying to kill I Jews. I have to tell my kid like that is you know. Like I turn on a documentary about castles and I walk away and I come back and I'm like, oh, you know, like, can you tell me something about what you learned? He's like, I don't like this. I'm like, well, what didn't you like? He's like, about the time when they killed the kids. What? Right. When they killed the kids in the castle and then they took it out. What? I thought I was putting on educational content <laughs> while I was making breakfast in the morning. And it turns out it's like about a coup. You know what I mean? Like this yeah. information would have been super helpful before I streamed this historical, you know, like so, whatever. So then, okay. So for example, it, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate because everyone has made points that I largely agree with. Should Disney Plus put in front of Beauty and the Beast live adaptation, there are two men who dance together? Because there are people who are offended by that and who want to explain it to their child. They can air that message in Florida and Texas and <laughs> like any, any, anybody that because that's, feels they need to, to me, vote on that. Censorship opens up that. It, it, it cuts that little hole that m will get widened out where people who are offended by progress and just by, you know, the first interracial kiss was on Star Trek. I mean, that was a big deal. And there were people That's who were offended That's historically inaccurate. Oh, what was it? <laughs> it wasn't on his Star Trek. I can get you the clip about what it is, but there's like a whole thing about how that get perpetuated as the rumor as the first interracial kiss on TV, but it wasn't. Yeah, that's true. That wasn't the first, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It was but it's no big deal, but it's just <laughs> See, America is very white and not smart. And that's why I represent you. Here's some art that will definitely not offend your ears. Our musician spotlight is on Dustin Lohman, a Park Slope-based singer-songwriter who's moderately disappointed that Bob Dylan never ran for president. In addition to composing and performing original music, Dustin runs a freelance ghostwriting business, Guitar and Pen, and produces original comedy videos which he distributes on social. You can check out his music at DustinLoman.com or Dustin-Loman.Bandcamp.com. How do you feel when you're a kid watching an old Bugs Bunny cartoon and Bugs Bunny goes in drag to try and lure a, 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 a character? Yeah. And he tries to, hey, you know, gets all sexy and whatever. And it's well, like, okay. On. Can you do that in No, I'm not going to do that again. I keep forgetting we're on TV. No, no, but no, no that's I mean, perfect. But it's just, I remember seeing well, many cartoons where you had da Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Um, they, they go and they drag, go and they drag. would try to lure yeah. a pervert in. Exactly, yeah, but, like they weren't, I, but I never saw that as being something in terms of LGBT. Transphobic Yeah, I never anything. saw yeah. anything like that. It's just, it's just funny. It's funny, yeah. <laughs> and once again, this goes back to where do you draw the line? But are we going to have to put a disclaimer at being those cartoons now or just take those out altogether? 
you know. Or like, or there's a black box that shows up over Bugs Bunny. It says, in this scene, he's dressed up as a woman and trying to have this person like lust after him, but this is transphobic, I so therefore. I think the question <laughs> for me is not, do we censor it? I think the question for me is, who were the decisions decision makers at the time that it was made, right? Right. So if all the people who make the decisions are straight or straight pretending white men, because we already, already know all the history that Their we know an, about. The answer like, is like, already yes. If, the if answer that is, is already, the, the that's answer, who it was. Then there should be other people in the room to make the decision yes. about whether or not the disclaimer is necessary. Mm -hmm. If all the people who made the content and all the people who are responsible for presenting it today look exactly the same, you have a problem. And you need to say, I'm going to critically think about this. Let's bring some other people in and let's decide if this needs a disclaimer from group vote. It won't be unanimous. It won't please everybody. But at least get some other voices in the room to make the decision. Yeah. I mean, you jumped to the end of the episode, but th oh, that's how sorry. we fix it. No, no, no. What you're saying is absolutely right. That's the problem in it because offense is in the eye of the beholder, right? Like we're all offended by different things. And some of the things that offend you might not offend me and right. vice versa. Mm -hmm. And we're always going to have that issue. But I guess it's like you're talking about responsibility. Culturally, we're responsible for what's put out there. And we don't want to become the people who ban books, but we also don't want to become people who are so irresponsible that we just keep making Adam Sandler movies. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but that's actually, but Adam Sandler is a great point of, if we don't try to offend, if our goal is to offend nobody, we end up with the most white bread, boring ass movie of all time. Which is like, I, I feel like a lot of modern, especially like comedies, like are not able to like lean into like humor that is like contextually offensive within the context of the film without being intelligent enough to like get that across to the audience. Yeah, they just being ham it's, it's or the they writer's room and the director. So I, one of my favorite things that I love is I can always tell, I can always tell when a black character is written by a black person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, They're always well, very absolutely. funny, right? Blazing absolutely. Saddles, case yes. in point. It's always <laughs> yeah. very yeah. funny. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, there are certain inside jokes, there's certain comedic timing, yeah. there's certain vocabulary and language choices that tell me as a viewer, this person gets it. Mm -hmm. I can tell 99% of the time. And there's like a t complete and lack of understanding outside of the community what that means to the viewer. Mm -hmm. I can tell right away if you're trying to make yeah. fun of me or if you're having fun with me. Right. And I think that is part of the problem. We don't have enough people who recognize that there's a difference and is immediately recognizable to the people that you're targeting. And you don't know that because you don't have enough black friends to be able to tell you yeah. the character would never say it in that way. Mm -hmm. You're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable and they wouldn't come in the door and say that to their mom. That's something they say to a friend and that's not allowed in the family home. Like there, there's nobody there to make those calls and decisions. And, and, and not just that, but even when they're a side character, because that was the biggest trope in like 90s and early 2000s, like teen comedies, especially you'd have the token black character who would add nothing other than say something <laughs> that they thought was funny every once in a while, which a white guy thought was funny yep. every mm -hmm. once in a while. Yep. And the black people are like, he, he's not black. <laughs> like that, I don't know who that character is, but that's not me. You know what the favorite one is? Bring it on. Yeah, they bring... had to, they had to shoot scenes that did not actually happen in the movie to put in the previews of the Clovers because the black audiences that they polled said like I don't want to go see this movie, so they f created fake scenes yeah. that never made it into production just to advertise it in order to get more people to watch. Now it turns out black people love that movie, but they never would have gone to see it had well, they not shot the, that... like the dummy scenes. Gabrielle Union. I was gonna say that was somebody who became famous who at the time was a nobody. Yeah, well that's who she it was. was she was black people famous already. Well, but she wasn't <laughs> as big as she is now. Like now she's a household name. She's crossover famous now. Yeah, crossover. That's famous. That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you guys think that there's an objective? Objectively offensive show or film that like everybody should like I would have thought Birth of the Nation and, and again it, we're, no. we're talking about the content well, you I need don't to see it to be entertained or see it for it to be educated well and that's and that's the thing I, I, I think there is a difference I, I think that's one of those things that can and has to be put in context you could never just let a group of kids watch that and be like oh here's a great movie <laughs> You have to put it in context and talk about it, yeah. you know, but like, do you think that there's anything? Can you guys think of anything? I know, Mike, your answer is probably always going to be no, it's because no, yeah, because like, I feel like there's always going to be an audience or something. Even if I agree, disagree with it on like, every single level conceivable, someone's going to write that they'll be like, it's pretty good. Like <laughs> well, every, yeah, every yeah, single yeah. time. Yeah. So I'm not saying, is there something that nobody would, would want to watch? I sure. mean, if, if you own YouTube, you know that, uh, 
there is something that everybody will watch. <laughs> sure. The worst things in the world. I mean, you dry, like paint drying, literally people, somebody will watch it. But my question is, is there something that we think culturally, is there a line, not for you to me and down the road, like, is there a line that culturally we're like, this is just not okay? I'm not saying, I, I'm not looking for an you answer know, to be honestly, yes or no. Honestly, my, my big one will probably be something along the lines of Gone with the Wind, I think that there is a glorification of that movie. I agree. Yeah. That is not warranted. And the context of the story is so how can you talk about going with the wind and not talk about the Academy Award ceremony? How can you talk about going with the wind and not be so like if you are not going to provide any information or contextualize or whatever, I think that that film is not one worth watching for anyone, unless you got the other details to go with it. Yeah. For, well, once again, for educational, I would say for that. Sure. But as a movie that for entertainment, that alone. <laughs> I just, yeah. What's it, what'd you say? I said that and that alone. I mean, that movie doesn't really offer, offer much value to me either. It's not very entertaining. It's like three and a half hours. Yeah. Like, once again, technically it's brilliant. Yeah, Technically yeah. it's, yeah, it's brilliant. brilliant. One time watch, just, I guess. Yeah, it has, one, it has several history. of those lines that everybody knows. Yeah. Um, as you said, there's controversy surrounding it, but you have, I think, the very first Academy Award for yes. uh, not just a person of color, a female person of color. Mm -hmm. Yes, those um, are the scenes that like the same woman was actually out. in yeah, like, Song yeah, of the exactly. South, like, which providing? I didn't realize like, until I just rewatched yeah. it. And she had to uh, fight to be even invited into the room yeah. exactly. to accept the award yeah. because she wasn't allowed. So, like all of that stuff. Like, if you don't talk about that stuff with Going with the Wind, you but can just leave was it trying behind. to not have that conversation. Like they cut out all the scenes with that character. Yeah. And I like, have a big problem with then, that. Like, so, so what? It, then why even have it? There's a character in the film. Like, so, own own the fact that that sucked for that person, for people of color at that time. Like, there's a lot more that they could do to teach or help the viewer learn like the history of that entire situation yeah i mean from that context that movie probably shouldn't be streaming anywhere but like that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be unavailable unaltered nowhere like i agree with that i i don't know that anything should be unavailable unaltered i yeah. mean you can yeah. if you look for it hard enough you can read mein Kampf, you know sure. what i mean like sure. yeah. go to i don't know that anything a million right now <laughs> don't don't google it yeah <laughs> you'll get in trouble yeah <laughs> <laughs> the FBI will be looking for you. So I, I think we're all saying roughly the same thing. There is a line, but the line doesn't mean let's get rid of it or let's censor it or let's cut it out. But there are things that should not be deemed as like this is entertainment at its best. We need to discuss it and contextualize it and have a conversation about it and learn from it. Sure. Is that? No, I agree. Did I, 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 I'm asking. If people are willing to have that conversation, like I agree with the point of like people, some people just aren't intelligent enough to consume cinema and see past the black and white of it. Right. Like you can't offer like a color palette to minds that don't work in that way, that don't want to be challenged in that way when they're watching movies. That's why those Fast and the Furious movies make so much money <laughs> yeah. oh, because people God. just go there and they they're just go like, and love it, don't they? Yeah, it's they, like seventy five <laughs> of them now. Yeah. yeah, it just colors on a screen moving really fast, yeah. and people walked out of it and they're like, there were people I knew in it, and it was cool. Vin like, Diesel actually died four years ago. <laughs> And they just keep re CGIing him into all those movies. Just twin. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not like, you know, the peak of cinema. Like, I'm a, a MCU fan. Like, I watch all the Marvel movies. I got t shirts, Amen. you know, Amen. like to go along with it. We won't so go there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people who thinks that entertainment for the sake of entertainment is not valuable. Um, but one thing that I think I, what we need to do is honestly sit down and have conversations with boys. That, I think, is the conversation that we are not willing to have. I think there's a lot of stuff that happens. We've got this rise in incel culture. We've got all this white supremacy stuff happening in gaming spaces. We've got all this stuff that's happening. And it is because people do not sit down and talk to boys. They say they are easier to raise. They say they are very easily, you know, like self-maintained and managed. And as a result, we've developed this culture where they can consume anything form their own opinions before they have any kind of idea of what that means and they march out into the world angry misunderstanding the world in the context and they are ready to take on like war and I think that that's something that we have to say if we're going to let people say everything is carte blanche you can consume what you want you know talk to adults whatever the conversation we have to have is with boys people talk to girls all the time 
what you wear, how you go, what to do, yeah. how, what time of day, what are your friends like, who do you talk to, what time are you on the phone, did you text someone? All of, there are all these safety rules and precautions, development, nurturing, hugs. We need to do that same thing with boys. If we're going to let them have it, we got to talk to them too. Well, I agree, but the problem is this. It's that big catch-22 again because the boys will only look up to certain figures, especially in entertainment with music, hip-hop, or whatever – actors or action stars, whatever. If there was a way we can sort of bring people down to earth that are like up there that we're just worshiping and just bring them down where we can actually have audiences with these boys. Because there was a time when actors and talented people would come to cities and do talks to their fans, but they would also try to set up a certain standard of morality that goes with being a man or being a young man or young woman, whatever, especially people of color and all that. I wish we could have more stuff like that because everything is so overly sensationalized. It seems like every decade we're becoming more and more removed from fundamental values as people. And I think the internet more than ever is just this gigantic tidal wave of just sensationalized BS. No offense, the MCU is part of this, no offense. But, uh, <laughs> but it's just that- I was that on so with you, I'm like, I remember the horrible little girl trotters talking to people about, no, you know, no, no, like- I have not era. been offended through this whole episode until right now. No, no, it's no big deal. No, I'm it's, kidding. It's, 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 I, just, I love the MCU because I'm a because I grew up on comics and I'm a nerd. Well, I grew up on them too, and I just you know it's it is what it is. But I, well, that's a whole other story because that's about adaptations. I just I just feel that media more than ever, young people, in, in video games are included also, and in all this. It's just boys need to be given some type of guidance. When I once again, I don't like bragging that I teach because I'm not really a good teacher, but but <laughs> I more or less talk phenomenal. to my students about be yourself. Don't be shy, don't be ashamed, but also don't blame things on things that are around you because it's not that, it's you. It's how you perceive things. And you can't be Vin Diesel. You can't be Sylvester Stallone. You know, you're whoever you are. You don't want to be that person, you know I mean? And even then, I grew up on characters like Charles Bronson and Clint Eastwood. Oh, and God. those are flawed characters. But yet, <laughs> what I liked about those movies back then was they didn't glorify these men as being perfect. They were shown as men that had issues that also had um, frailties, and they were in a situation that, okay, either I do it this way with a gun or I walk away and do it this way. And sometimes they were surprised, and there was a lot of ambiguity with their motivations. And, but it's just nowadays, it's strictly boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah, motherfucker, boom. Okay, and walks off. I get, well, I got the girl, by the way, and I walk. No, it's like, and all these incel boys, like you mentioned, yeah, a lot of them, this is what they want to be, but they can never be that. And it's not meant to be for them to be that. And I just... You know, you know they have maximum punch in in their contracts for the action heroes now. I believe it, and that's and that's crap. See that kind of garbage. I mean, it's just heroes to can me. You, are, can you? No, go ahead. Can you explain to that? Because the audience yeah. is gonna be like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Oh, so maximum punch is a flavored drink. It's really good. <laughs> So each, you know, like actor has a, a writer that goes along with their contract when you get signed on for a movie. And there's certain stipulations in order for me to be, you know, part of this film. Like it's famous, you know, like, oh, they, they only want green M&Ms in their, right. you know, bowl yeah. or whatever. Those kind of silly the things. Urban legends, right. But like Rock, The Rock and Vin Diesel, they have like maximum number of punches or hits that they can take per film. So if you want me to be the hero in your movie, I will only accept 24 punches you know, per movie. Otherwise, like you have to find someone else to be the, you know, the star of the movie. So there are like maximum punches. Yeah. And the same way that like it's similarly like or, or dissimilarly, um, a lot of times women have like a no nipple clause yeah. in their in their contracts for nudity. And so like it used to be filmmakers and directors used to violate those clauses frequently. And so now they put tape over their nipples to make sure that if it gets into the scene, it's automatically cut because it like destroys the aesthetic of it. So it's a similar kind of concept, except for it's for macho ego yeah, protection. It's an ego. So, Protection. Yeah, it's it's which and the thing is too. I actually think that's kind of cool. At the same time, it's like okay, well, <laughs> you want to make sure there's just enough, but not too much, because this is the rock. This is yeah. you know whatever. It's just I don't but, know. It's, so so it it brings up an interesting question, and I'm not saying I'm not even going to propose that we have the answer to it. But you're talking about you know these people being uh, these icons coming in and being uh, almost godlike. Godlike, yeah. Do we really, with what we discussed earlier with the Bill Cosby's, uh, do we want them to be the the role models? I don't think most athletes and actors should be role models. I think when you're talking about talking to boys, I think it's a societal thing where, I mean, and, and let's be honest, boys don't have it good either because they are told you're going to fit this mold. You're going to be the hero. You're going to be the Stallone. You're, you're only going to take six punches today. <laughs> You know, so so they're set up for failure right away, and they're told, like, through film, 
you got to chase the girl. You got to stand outside of her window. You got to hound her. Like, that's romantic. She wants to be chased. If she says no, she means yes. Yep. I mean, we know that that's worse. a trope. But think that, about the people that were writing those films. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking who about was in the yeah. room. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Woody Allen. I mean, you got Woody Allen, who it's one of those guys where Manhattan. Look can at that you, movie. Can you separate Woody Allen from his films? Because you're like, well, sure, he's a great filmmaker and he's quirky. And then you watch it and you're like, oh, he's just playing himself. He's kind of a creep. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. but before yeah. we knew about that, that was funny. Yeah. Now it's not funny. It's just awkward. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was like like anything Louis C.K. did, you're like, he's making a lot of masturbation jokes. <laughs> like, oh, oh, yeah. So I, I, it's tough. And none of us have the answer. I think we, we have we have film gurus. We have casual nerds. We have all of us. And 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 the people just in this conversation alone f- fill the gamut pretty well. I think the real answer is. Like, we do have a responsibility as a society to have these conversations and put these things in context. And I think it's okay. That's a given. I agree. I, I, yeah. I, I think we need to do more of that. Um, you know, this show was started because I'm like, we're not talking about important topics enough. Like, what happened to, to PSAs and after school specials? Like, that concept, like, I get it. We're all streamers now. And so kids are not, you know, whatever. But, like, that concept of, like, it's 8 p.m. Where are your kids now? Right. Like, this is your brain on drugs. This is what it's like. You know, like, there are certain messages that you get from a society that they deem important. And you think to yourself, like, oh, this baby looks really small if they smoke. That doesn't seem good. Like, you start to think about things in a way that you never questioned or thought about before. And I just wonder what happened to the art of public safety well, concerns. You just said it. They, they still make those, but they're more, in my opinion, they're more exploitive as opposed yeah. to being art. They don't, everything is so sensationalized, even with the PSAs now. It's and an it, advertisement. It's so more, what, it's more what are they about ad. now? Like, I haven't exactly. seen one in ages. Yeah, they're on, I've seen them, but they're just like, okay, that was more cool than it's, in terms of having a meeting. It didn't really, see, it just looked cool, you know, but yeah. there's, it's so, everything is so slick nowadays and so subliminal with all the flashiness, but the, the message is, gets lost. It's a, it's a PSA as a meaning, it's, it's a, it's a pro bono ad. It's something that yes, people are yeah, putting together. Yeah. And, you're, and you're talking about people who are... That's the problem is we're allowing ourselves to be completely dominated by the dollar. I mean, it's, it's the problem across the board in all these topics we talk about. But especially in film and, you know, we're talking about the moneymaker and you hate the MCU. I mean, the biggest I, problem... I don't hate the MCU. You can hate it if hate you want. I hate it a little bit. I don't hate but, it. But, no, I'll, I'll, well, after we're done, I'll explain you what, what it is. That would be another show. But, like, <laughs> but <laughs> the problem I do have with the MCU is they're churning out so much content because it's about let's make as much money as possible. And I think, I, I think it is irresponsible because it devalues... You know, films... Going to see a film used to be an event. Thank you. It they used still to be charge a, you like it is. They, yeah, you, you yeah, may as well go to, you like you well go to an orchestra performance because you're yeah. paying an arm and a leg. Yeah, yeah, you're paying a lot of money, and the theaters aren't making that money. The theaters are only making money on the drinks the and, the, and the yeah. concessions. Yeah. concessions. Yeah, and and like the little passes they sell. I, if the theater goes away, part of me will die. I would never want it to go away, and that's why when people are complaining about shit, and I'm like. Just go to the fucking theater. I am so sick of the straight release to on-demand kind of stuff. I agree. Like, yeah. that, that's not how films were meant to be watched. But if we are only after the almighty dollar, I just think maybe we need to be choosier and stupid shit won't get made as much. I don't know. Or <laughs> are, is our society so stupid that Adam Sandler movies are going to be the only thing in theaters I, at I some point? I also want to just note, like if you are making a movie or a film or something and you're listening to this, like turn the lights on. Like why is everything <laughs> pitch black all the time? Like I couldn't even watch the stupid Batman movie because I couldn't see anything. I had to close what, all the, the curtains one? in the house. I had to turn off all the lights and I still couldn't see what was happening. You're and not also, wrong. That film was complaint. meant to be seen in a theater, though. And, also, and, yes. I'm sorry, Zoe, I could kick your ass. I do not believe that you could be Catwoman. And that's the only well, aside that I, I have. believe her as Catwoman before I believe uh, what's her face as uh, Mary Jane from Spider Man. So, yeah. Oh, Zendaya? Don't give me that I BS. Oh, I, I want to hear it. Don't even go there. We're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. I thought you were going to like bring it on. I'm the person I know shits on DC films, but yet, oh, it was so dark. no, I don't want to hear it. 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 All right. That was a good movie. No, I need a little bit of candlelight. And maybe I can watch it again. See, y'all get me riled up. I don't want to. I made a mistake sitting my Myself between these two, I should have. So dark. Should let them choke each other. I'm not a DC fan. I'm not a DC fan. Just ask them to turn on the lights. No, but it's not about that. That film was. You you didn't see it in the theater, then. Let me guess. I didn't see it in. You gotta see it in the theater. That film is beautifully shot. But I will say a lot of stuff. Like they've they've started. 
the stuff that's made for TV and the stuff that's shown on TV, okay. it's not corrected for the TV. And and the big problem that filmmakers have is the TVs are coming out with that with that scanning with yes. that it, like filmmakers were all just now finding out. I'm like, have you never bought a TV? I've been complaining about that for years. That was made for sports. And that's it. It was a Not whole other format. It, TV in itself was another format of storytelling. Theatrical cinema is another format. But now there's so much overlap, and it just you know people just don't get it. The, the way things are lit now, everything is all the aspect ratio, the composition, yeah. the lenses they're using, and there's just so much that you know I'm just thinking, wow, it's like they're trying so hard to make this cinematic. But I just want to see a good TV show. I was watching an old CSI Miami rerun the other night, and it was like, man, they were really pushing the envelope back then because everything was just yeah. And I remember that was a hot. Method but they of, knew you know, the medium they were filming Yeah, for. exactly. But everybody was trying to be so edgy and everything. And I'm just thinking, can't we just have TV shows be television? And can we have cinema be cinema again? So we can all agree there is one thing objectively offensive. When you make something that it's too vague and you don't know what medium you're filming for, knock that shit off. Otherwise, Robert Banks is coming for you. And he's got a horde of students. And they all have little hammers and weapons. And they, they're going to get you. <laughs> Thank you guys for having this conversation <laughs> oh, today. We, we, are we we're wrapping up? I just wanted to oh, say. Oh, no, you can say well, as much as say, you I, want. I never got to say who Reggie Nolder was. Yeah, Reggie Nolder. Yeah. You know who he is. Reggie Nolder, um, he was a cabaret singer back during the war. And I guess he may, I believe he was a Holocaust survivor too. But he's famous for playing um, Kurt Barlow in the Salem's Lot movie. Wow. Remember the vampire? Whoa. Like the real thin dude? With like the, the, ball, like the blue. Look like Nosferatu yeah, kind of? That's, wow. that's Reggie Whoa. Nolder. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that's Salem's really Lot? Wild. Yeah, the original years, David yeah, Soul. Yeah, 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 yeah. Years, we were years, talking years about it. Yeah, we were oh, talking you about see it. it. One of the best vampire made-for-TV movies. Actually, one of the best vampire movies ever. I love vampire movies. Toby Hooper so. directed. That's a good one. You should yeah. see it. Yeah, definitely. But that's that's Reggie Nolder, and, and they like, are remaking yeah. Nosferatu as yeah, well. Same. Yeah, they're doing a Nosferatu remake. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about, it, but I guess we'll we'll have Roger to see. Roger Eggers, man, it'll be interesting. We'll see. We'll see because he's he's a pretty good director. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of film, uh, on the topic right now. Um, a Mike went and some of the folks from the Cleveland uh, film fi commission film commission. Thank you. The Cleveland film commission <laughs> are making a documentary on you on me. Oh, I thought, I thought you made it. My, I, was, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. And if, <laughs> get, oh, yeah. real, real quick, just, just as an aside, uh, tell us about that. Uh, in short form, what 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 was the impetus to that, and what's it about? You know, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, Mike went, I've known for years, and um, apparently he's been fascinated by what I've been doing since the early '90s, and he just sort of followed what I've been making, the films and the stuff that I've been working with other people, and my my work ethics, and then on top of that, my passion for celluloid. And so he asked me, "Hey, can I do a thing on you?" I was like, "Oh yeah, everyone's been trying to do a doc on me because I had other people approach me." I was like, "But whatever, go for it, man." And so. But he's been working on this for the last four and a half years. That's, and that's um, great. It's, he's been just following me around and loads of interviews. And um, just it's been an interesting process. And I just feel weird because I'm still wondering, am I that interesting? Because I think I'm a very dull, boring geek. Why am, no, but why are you what you are is opinionated. <laughs> I can't wait for you well, to I'm review very, the film I'm, about you. I'm very opinionated, yeah. <laughs> I'm opinionated for all the wrong reasons. This fucking though, man. sucks. <laughs> this is like I, Harlem Nights I'm 2. I'm sure it'll be like perfectly lit, though, he, so. It's funny because <laughs> he even they even use techniques that I use in my films in for the doc about me. I'm just thinking, oh, it's kind of interesting. But we'll see. I don't know. I told and, him, I'm very honored that he's doing and this. I, and but. I love that you shoot on actual film and, yeah, and continue to which do that. Really cares about nowadays. <laughs> it matters. It matters. It matters. Yes. You say it matters, then I'm gonna believe it. It matters. So I, it matter. it. I agree 100. You know, it matters. It's funny because um, we talk about how things are going with cinema and all that, but yet everybody wants to say that everything that's 20th century is so passe and get away from it. It's like, well, no. I think celluloid is better than ever now, and people should explore the possibilities with it because there's so much you can do with it. I mean, digital is cool too, and I, I do stuff digitally also, but right. my main passion and enjoyment and excitement is with celluloid and the magic that you can get from that. There's an alchemist perspective of making stuff, but I think because the way the industry is so inundated with, we got to make it look cool and it's got to be faster, we got to save money and whatever, everybody's so immediately dismissive of traditional cinema or traditional cellular. As, as soon as as soon as it becomes about money, the, the art dies. And we all know that. And that's why, well, that's yeah. why these filmmakers will make these blockbusters and then they're like, so I can fund my indie project that I actually care about. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's like I was reading an article about um, people were 
it was about digital versus film, and they were, it was mainly Tarantino disputing about how he has to keep doing celluloid or he's done in the industry, and, and everybody was just trashing him, saying he's an arrogant, egotistical guy living in the past and living this little boy fantasy. And I'm just thinking, who are these a-holes? I mean, and these were all industry dudes just saying, you know, you got to change for the times, and the new 4K so-and-so, and, and this camera here, and the red camera that, and, you know, just, that's fine, but it's just, this is a man that's dedicated to traditional cinema. And... There's Spielberg, there's Corsese, there's Wes Anderson, P.T. Anderson, Chris Nolan, and a bunch of other no-name filmmakers that are still embracing the magic of celluloid. And I still think that you can get a lot out of that. And I just think it's messed up that everybody just wants to just say, film is dead, you know, let's just move on to something better. The only person I think that has a valid reason to use digital more than anybody else is James Cameron, for what he's doing with the yeah. Avatar and everything. And there's been other films that have been shot digital that look, look amazing, you know, but why should we, I just see it as another avenue that we can go. And that's one of the reasons why I think Mike is intrigued about me because nobody, everybody has dismissed film. And um, I'm the only guy that's still making an effort. Oh, can I plug something? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, my form, well, he's still my intern, but he's kind of evolved past me. Uh, Mark um, Pendergast, great young man. He's only just turned 23 years old. He interned with me for a few years, helped me work on my feature. This, he's a kid. He is starting in Northeast Ohio, the first film lab in the Midwest since wow. 1996. Awesome. And it will be open to the public next year. Um, it'll be MVP Labs, film processing, printing, 16, 35, 8 millimeter. Sync sound, magnetic sound recording, optical sound recording, compositing, AB roll, all celluloid. The uh, sound system he has came from Skywalker Sound. He, wow. he, he inherited um, George Lucas's um, sound uh, mag system. For, so the stuff that he has was used on all the films, Willow and Raiders and Indiana Jones and the, all the Star Wars, all that stuff. So this kid, he's actually trying to bring celluloid back. Jeez. That's and incredible. So, That's and awesome. he wants people to come back to Love shooting that. films. So. Yeah. Um, he, well, you got to bring him down here. He he doesn't speak much. He's very quiet. But, <laughs> but the kid. We'd love to have him here in the studio just yeah. to hang out. Yeah. So he is. It's the fact that I inspired this kid. That that to me is amazing because he wouldn't have done this without me. Not that I'm giving myself credit for this, but no. But what you're what you're saying is exactly right because when you're able to like kind of help mentor, and and it pays off. Yeah. Not that it pays off for you personally. Of course, you're going to feel good about it, but that you actually made a difference, that's well, huge. And I'm actually happy there'll be a lab here that I can drive to out in Seoul <laughs> and instead of having to ship stuff out He's, to, he's um, more LA, concerned you know. about the perks. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's just, no, it's, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, and on top of that, too, I mean, he, he's passionate. And I think that's the thing. When you're a writer and you want to tell a story, you're passionate about it. When you're a cinematographer, you're passionate about the light and the optics. Or if you're a sound man and the sound mixing and all and then if you're a director and if you're an actor, if you're passionate about the craft and giving it to the mass to share, that's what it should be about. And I just feel that more than ever now, the industry is so caught up with the politics and all the censorship stuff and everything else and less about telling great stories and finding new great stories to tell instead of ripping off or remaking or recycling what's been done the last 50, 60 years. There's just so much out there that needs to be expressed and presented and people can grow with it the young boys you know i would love to make films for, for bald fat men and make them the hero for a change you know i mean i yeah. want to see stuff like that i want to see the, the the you know the, the people that we don't always see be highlighted and indie films have done this they're still they've been doing it but nobody sees these films there's been thousands of films to come out of europe that have addressed this or south america or whatnot there's just there's a ton of cinema out there but you have to search it out same thing with music you know so mm -hmm. uh, you know so yeah i mean yeah, capitalism has been the main driving force to take those things out of it. It's we want sex appeal, and this is what we define as sexy, and that's going to be it. And so I do think we, to be a responsible uh, consumer of these things, we do need to be able to watch them in context, to have conversations with people afterwards, and to look for things that aren't just like, the, oh, this is the new Netflix movie. You're allowed to go out there and try to experience some stuff, and some of the best films you'll ever see, even if you're not a film connoisseur. Some of the best things you're going to see were the indie films that were being made yes. when when Long Duck Dong was on the screen. Like the 80s had some great independent films that was driving cinema, growing it into what would be the next couple of decades. And so we need to be able to do this. I think it's the responsible thing. Great art in all aspects gets better with age. And there's a ton of films that may have been from the 60s or the 70s or whatnot that may look dated, but are actually great stories that can be watched over and over and over again. I mean, whether it's A Clockwork Orange or whether it's um, the, longest, the original Longest Yard or there's just Deliverance. There's just tons of movies that still hold up. But you just have to look at the fact that 
this was the decade of this subject matter and how they explored it, whether it was sexism or racism or whatever. Boys in the band, you know, you want to see an interesting film about LGBTQ, you know, William Friedkin, you know, he, he took risk with that. There's just thousands cruising. of films out there. Yeah, cruising, yeah, yeah, cruising. I mean, there's just so much stuff that people need to take time out to discover. So, I mean, I tell my students constantly, there's no excuse. The internet is here, do the research, look for it, explore, and just learn. And like you said, just, but quit going with the rest of the, I don't want to say sheep, but just because something <laughs> new is out doesn't mean you got to see it right away because right. there's a good chance you're going to forget about it within two weeks. But maybe you might want to revisit that film or maybe check that film out years later because there's films that came out in the 80s that I didn't see that I'm actually watching now. And some of them actually are like, wow, that was pretty good. Or some of them, uh, it's like, why do they even make that? I don't know. It's just. It's but but <laughs> everything you says, right, because so even even when you have something that has Kevin Spacey or Bill Cosby in it, for example, the passion that some of the like. I hate to take away something that other people put passion into that they didn't have control over maybe this one aspect of right. it. And that's why it's salvageable in my mind. That's why all of these things have some kind of redemptive value. Anyone who's worked on any kind of film of any size realizes how many people, how many hours, how many things go into making this and telling this story. And if I had directed something that some asshole was in and it's like ruined it for me, I'd be, I'd be mortified because I, that was still my, that's my child. That's my baby. Right. Um, so I think we're going to end it here, but we could be talking about this for days and days and days because it's an interesting topic. And what we did today is what I'd love to see more of in our culture and society is talking about this stuff. Why is it offensive? Why do we find it offensive? Why does somebody find this offensive that we don't? And what do we do with that? I mean, hopefully the answer is, as you said earlier, learn from it so that we don't repeat those same mistakes. And so we make new, interesting art, not just revisiting the same tropes of last year. So thank you everybody for doing this. Thank you for having this conversation. Uh, continue to do what you're doing and be passionate and be nerdy. And uh, I just, I, you're welcome to come here anytime and have this conversation with me because I could talk film and, and TV and entertainment all day, every day. Uh, for you out there, hopefully you could, you got some new uh, things to watch or avoid. I don't know. Harlem Nights. It depends on where you land there. <laughs> you keep plugging that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're real bored, you can go to the goingtherepodcast.com to check out links to our socials. And now we're on YouTube, so you can watch us and see our beautiful faces on video. We are the protagonists of next year. That's who we are. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. While you're at it, give us a rating. Share with a friend and subscribe. Support indie films, but also support indie musicians. Check out this musician spotlight of the episode, Dustin Lohman, at DustinLohman.com or dustin lomanbandcampcom Time and you creep. Holy the past. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Lindsay Baker, Joe Cali, and Bobby Thomas. <laughs>